Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm your host, Joseph Pierce. Thanks for joining me. And this week, we're looking at the great C.S. Lewis um, and looking at his life um, and understanding him uh, as the author with the authorial authoritative voice that allows us to understand his works, his great works of uh, fiction and nonfiction. So uh, when I when I look about look at the Catholic cultural revival and the Catholic literary revival, I normally um, divide it into four sections very, very briefly. The, the first is the gestation period, uh, the time of uh, when it's in utero, if you like, in the womb before it becomes fully manifest, uh, and that's the period from the romantic, from the, rom- the romantic poetry of Wordsworth and Coleridge, lyrical ballads published in seventeen ninety eight, through to the conversion of John Henry Newman in eighteen forty five. So a forty seven year gestation period. Then we have the first period of the Catholic cultural revival, which is the Newman period. 1845, Newman's uh, uh, entry into the church until his death in 1890, a, a 45-year period. We then have an interlude, what I call the decadent interlude, between 1890 and 1900. Uh, that, that, that that decade is sometimes called the decade of decadence, or the decadent decade, or la fin de siècle. Uh, the 1890s or the naughty 90s uh but again in the midst of that many of the uh english and french decadent writers became converts to catholicism so it's certainly part if you like the underbelly of this catholic cultural revival we're talking about but then the the, the next definitive period so oscar wilde the, the the godfather of the english decadence is received into the, into the church on his deathbed in 1900. 1900 is also the year in which G.K. Chesterton is first published. So I normally speak about the next period being the period of the Chester Belloc, the period at which Chesterton and Belloc are at the forefront, the avant-garde of the Catholic cultural revival. Um, And that takes us from 1900 until Chesterton's death in 1936. All works out quite well because then we come to the next period, which is what I call either the Inklings period, named after a group that C.S. Lewis founded in Oxford, or even the Tolkien and Lewis period of the Catholic uh, cultural or the Catholic literary revival, which we could say last from the publication of The Hobbit in 1937, the year after Cheston's death, to the death of Tolkien in 1973. So so we have Lewis and Tolkien as as, as being at the forefront of this uh, period of the Catholic cultural revival from the mid-30s to, to, to the mid-70s. Now, what's intriguing here, of course, though, unlike most of the other writers uh, that, that, that form uh, the, the, the heart of this revival, um, Lewis, of course, was not a Catholic. And so I would look, look at that aspect of, of uh, him, uh, of his life as well. He's not technically a Catholic, so it raises all sorts of questions. How Catholic or anti-Catholic or non-Catholic was he? Um, so that's perhaps what we'll try to grapple with as as part of the core of, of of this episode. First of all, Lewis always despised modernism. Uh, I'm talking about theological modernism here, the modernism that believes that the church should move with the world rather than that the church should move the world. He called modernism Christianity and water. It's the dilution of the, uh, the, 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 the the purity of the gospel with the water of the world, should we say, worldliness, uh, fashion. So where, uh, as Chesterton, who was not a Catholic when he wrote his book Orthodoxy, was trying to look at a way in which uh, Christians of different 
should we say, denominations could work together? And what 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 constitutes Christianity in this broader sense of the word, as long as by broader we don't mean uh, so broad-minded that it becomes Christianity in water, it becomes diluted Christianity. So what we're looking for is, is that, that distillation, that which distills the essence of Christianity, not that which dilutes it. So for Chesterton, in, in his book Orthodoxy, he took the words of the Apostles' Creed as, as, as that which it delineates uh, Christian doctrine. And the Apostles' Creed is something, of course, which Eastern Orthodox, Catholics and Anglicans and indeed other Protestant denominations are comfortable with, with uh, um, uh, agreeing with. So the Apostles' Creed is a distillation. Lewis, on the other hand, in Mere Christianity, was, trying, was basically doing the same thing. What is it that, that, that brings us all together? And what he was working for was a, a, a highest common factor, as distinct from a lowest common denominator. Lowest common denominator is, again, that Christianity and water, that modernist dilution of the faith with worldliness. The highest common factor is, what is it unites all Christians? And of course, so that's what he does in mere Christianity, he shows that, and, and of course, certain sacramental dimensions, baptism, etc. But 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 certainly a belief in the Trinity, uh, uh, in the unity of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that's essential. And also the incarnation that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And these certainly are a minimum requirements for to be considered merely Christian. So Tolkien, sorry, so Chesterton and Lewis were doing similar things, trying to unite authentic Orthodox Christians, uh, even though they may have differences uh, in, 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 in their approach to, should we say, ecclesiology, to an understanding of what is the church. Interesting that in one of the first works that C.S. Lewis wrote are uh, following his Christianity, uh, following his conversion to Christianity, which we discussed somewhat last week in the episode on Tolkien, Tolkien's influence and Chesterton's influence on uh, uh, Lewis's conversion. He didn't write too much before his conversion, mostly poetry, and most of which is not read very widely these days. But his first work as a Christian was a book called The Pilgrim's Regress. And this, this uh, shows Lewis's journey uh first of all away from christianity his loss of faith as a child his embrace of atheism and then the various you know intellectual currents of the day that that, that he engaged with and ultimately rejected in order to come back to christianity and uh it's interesting there that um he uh, speaks in that book about reason as a beautiful woman in shining armor uh, uh, with two younger sisters, theology and philosophy, having the power to uh, conquer, to defeat the monstrous spirit of the age and to release people that have been enslaved by the spirit of the age. So we see him using in formal allegory here this understanding of the union, the unity of faith and reason, fides et ratio, that marriage which is at the heart of all authentic Christian theology. Um, as uh, Chesterton remarked, uh, when someone said that um, that religion and theology are not the same thing, when a religion is controlled by the theologians, religious people stay away. Chesterton uh, responded that actually all that theology is is that part of religion that requires brains. That we do have to have a rational dimension to religion. So. Uh, Looking at parallels between um, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, both of them left the land in which they were born and ended up in Oxford. Uh, but there's a difference that, that, that Lewis left Belfast in Northern Ireland to move to England, settling uh, in Oxford. Tolkien was born in South Africa, uh, ending up eventually in Oxford. But whereas Tolkien left South Africa behind. It doesn't form part of his enduring adult psyche, should we say. That's not true of Lewis, because Lewis never fully left Belfast behind. I talk about this somewhat in my book, C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church, um, uh, about the influence of his anti-Catholic uh, uh, childhood on uh, throughout his life. 
Um, both of them, again, looking at parallels between Tolkien and Lewis, both of them fought in World War One. Tolkien uh, spoke about his serving and the animal horror of the of of the of the Battle of the Somme. Um, he also talks, by the way, Tolkien about how the character of Samwise Gamgee is based upon uh, Tolkien's own personal Batman. That's not uh, Batman as in the superhero. Uh, every every officer above a certain rank in the British Army, and, and Tolkien and Lewis were both officers, had a private soldier as a personal servant. Um, and this is this personal servant known as a Batman. And Tolkien was so um, uh, impressed by his own working class uh, private soldier who seemed to be more courageous and have more natural nobility and virtue than he did, that he sort of um, honoured that unknown soldier by being, if you like, the inspiration for Samwise Gamgee, Frodo's gardener in The Lord of the Rings. The main thing I, I, during the First World War as regards Lewis's development was his first reading of G.K. Chesterton. Now, by this time, Lewis is an atheist and somewhat cynical about things. And But he picks up a volume of G.K. Chesterton's essays. Unfortunately, we don't know which particular volume of essays by Chesterton this was. But it captivated Lewis immediately. And Lewis says in Surprised by Joy, his autobiography, that you'd have thought that Chesterton would be one of the least uh, congenial of writers for an atheist, a cynical atheist like Lewis. But nonetheless, he couldn't help liking Chesterton. He liked his sense of humor. He liked his goodness. There's something about Chesterton's just the, 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 the goodness, the sanctity of the character, which is attractive. Um, and he said, you know, it's like being attracted to someone, you know, even though you have no intention of sort of being like them. And he also uh, um, loved the way that Chesterton used reason. Now, Lewis, uh, I, I was born a long time after Lewis. Um, but I think one thing I have in common with Lewis, we were both raised to believe you had to choose between, uh, between faith or reason. That uh, you, can, you can be religious, but you can only be religious by abandoning reason. Uh, or you could have reason, but if you're going to have reason, you have to abandon the comforts of religion. You couldn't have both because they're mutually contradictory. This was uh, Lewis's position as well when he first read uh, Chesterton when he was uh, uh, recovering from trench fever in a field hospital in France. Um, and he came to realize through reading Chesterton that faith and reason, not far from being mutually incompatible, were uh, mutually inseparable. So he he like like me he began reading more and more Chesterton. In the mid nineteen twenties, he meets Tolkien for the first time and, and is forced to confront his own prejudices. He says that he'd been taught since his first arrival in Oxford never to trust a philologist. Uh, you have to understand that Oxford University at the time there's a bit of a civil war going on in the academic world between the linguists, those who studied languages the philologists such as Tolkien and the literature people, those who studied works of literature such as uh, C.S. Lewis. So there's, a, there's this, this division between the, the languages and literature. So Tolkien has said, as Lewis had been told upon his arrival at Oxford, never to trust a linguist. And he's been told ever since childhood, never to trust a papist. That's a term of abuse for a Catholic. And he said, Tolkien was both a linguist and a Catholic. So from these unpromising beginnings, uh, a friendship was born and largely because of their shared love for mythology in general and the, the mythology of Northern Europe and especially Norse mythology in particular that brought them together. Even though they weren't united by, by faith, Lewis was still a, a, um, an atheist. Tolkien was a, a Catholic. And then in 1927, I believe it was, uh, C.S. Lewis read uh, G.K. Chesterton's book, The Everlasting Man. We should probably say a little bit about The Everlasting Man. I, I, I can't remember how much we said about it in the episode on Chesterton, but it, it either way, good and important things bear repetition. So 
H.G. Wells, uh, just after World War I, had written a, a series of books called The Outline of History, which is basically an atheistic, secular, progressivist understanding of human history, uh, where the idea is that the, 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 the past is barbaric uh, and the future will be a golden age in which barbarism and superstition and religion will be left behind and everyone will be happy because science will have delivered us from, uh, from our own uh, barbarism and ignorance. So Hilaire Belloc uh, wrote a, a book called Mr. Belloc, sorry, wrote a book called A, a Companion to H.G. Wells's Outline of History, to which H.G. Wells wrote a reply, Mr. Belloc objects, and then Belloc wrote a reply to Wells's reply, uh, Mr. Belloc still objects, and they went back and forth. But it was very argumentative in, the, uh, in a quarrelsome way, and Chesterton, one of Chesterton's maxims was of his relationship with his brother, which I take as a personal motto, we were always arguing, but we never quarreled. So an argument is a disagreement based upon getting at the truth, always held with charity. A quarrel is, 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 is merely uh, an argument uh, that's about winning or about harming the opponent um, in the absence of charity. So we must learn to argue without quarreling. The argument between Belloc and H.G. Uh, uh, Wells became somewhat quarrelsome. They, the two men became enemies. This was not Chesterton's way. So he was a friend of H.G. Wells and a great friend of Belloc. He remained friends to both men, uh, even though he wrote a book called The Everlasting Man, which was his own response to H.G. Wells' history, but done with such charity that Wells was not offended. And in fact, on two occasions, I think, in the book where Wells is mentioned and Wells' book, The Outline of History, is mentioned, it's done with great charity and grace. But nonetheless, uh, Chesterton, like Belloc, thought that Wells was wrong. Uh, and uh, the, the point about the everlasting man is the, uh, is the difference that the incarnation makes to history. So uh, the, 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 first part, the first part of the book is, is, pre, is, is pre-Christian, the, the before Christ, and the second part of the book is is Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. In other words, following the uh, the the incarnation of the gospel and the difference that that makes to human history. That's the basic the thesis of Chesterton's book. The first chapter in part one is the man in the cave, so about the caveman, and the first chapter in part two is the God in the cave. In other words, Christ being born in the stable in Bethlehem. Uh, so Lewis reads this book in 1927 uh, and is blown away by it. He says that he saw the Christian outline of history laid out before him in a way that made sense. And um, this was a major milestone upon Lewis's um, progress from atheism back to Christianity. Uh, and around this time, he probably had been called a theist. Uh, one who believed in, in, in God, uh, but not necessarily the Christian God. But again, this, this reading of, of Chesterton was, was, was crucial to Lewis's development um, in this uh, respect. A little postscript on that, by the way. Uh, when a young Jewish girl in New York first read H.G. Wells' Outline of Sanity, she immediately ceased to be Jewish and became an atheist. She would later become a communist. She would then eventually read the works of C.S. Lewis and become a Christian. That um, that young lady would become Mrs. Joy Lewis, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis's wife. Um, so ironically, what we have here is that Wells uh, was uh, Wells brought, uh, turned Joy. David Minnishi then was into an atheist uh, and Lewis turned uh, Joy Gresham, as she then was uh, being married, uh, into a Christian. But it was G.K. Chesterton's outline of history which converted C.S. Lewis. So such is the power, and that's one of the reasons we, what we're talking about is so important, this, 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 this cultural uh, revival is a, is a network of grace and a networks of minds which activate and energize each other and bring people to Christ. Um, none of us is an island. We all interact with others. And we either have a good or positive or negative effect upon other people. Um, okay, where are we now? 
So uh, having become a Christian, we see he wrote that book, The, the, um, the Pilgrim's Regress, which I've spoken about already somewhat, could say more, but, but won't. Lewis wrote then a book called The Great Divorce and shows the influence of another great Catholic writer that's been the subject of, of, of the authority, and that's Dante. Uh, this is a look at the afterlife and uh, hell. We seem, we seem to begin in, 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 in hell, in this dismal town, but then there's a day trip, a holiday uh, from hell to the this bright place, which is clearly purgatory because the the souls that come down from the high land, high ground, which is a purgatory, of course, is the antechamber of heaven, are doing so with a penitential spirit, uh, to ha to 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 um, uh, as acts of penance. Where if you're in heaven proper, um, your sins have been completely and utterly forgiven, uh, and there's no acts of penance that are necessary. So this is Lewis, uh, uh, clearly influenced by Dante in a great psychology. An interesting thing about Lewis and his relationship to, to, to Catholicism and politics is uh, a, an event with a writer we haven't figured, uh, featured yet in the, ep uh, in the authority and, and probably should, the great Catholic convert poet, her Roy Campbell. Tolkien and Lewis were in their favourite pub in Oxford, uh, The Bird and Baby or The Eagle and Child. And there's this mysterious man in the corner with a wide-brimmed hat, uh, quasi military uniform, which during World War II, and this person served in the King African, the Royal African Rifles, King's African Rifles. Um, and Lewis, uh, Tolkien noticed him in the corner, paying much more attention to to, to Lewis uh, and Tolkien's and the other uh, inkling friends' discussion of poetry than is usual uh, amongst people. Uh, and this this mysterious stranger in the corner reminded uh, Tolkien of, of of Strider, Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, Tolkien was in the middle of writing the Lord of the Rings at the time. When this man introduced himself as Roy Campbell, Lewis uh, uh, attacked him vehemently. Lewis um, um, had written uh, uh, a poem uh, uh, to the author of A Flowering Rifle, which is a poem that Lewis uh, Tol Campbell wrote in defense of the nationalist forces in Spain in the Spanish Civil War. Um, Campbell had lived in, was living in Spain when the war began. Um, the monks whom he'd befriended, the Carmelite monks, were killed in cold blood by the communists. The priest who had received Campbell and his wife and children into the church was killed in cold blood by the communists. So, of course, Campbell was on the side of, uh, of the nationalists against the, the Marxists in that war. But most people in England, uh, certainly all the socialists, but most people, except for the Catholics, were uh, were on the side of the of the Marxists, including C.S. Lewis, surprisingly enough. Um, and so, so he had, when he when he realised it was it was Campbell in the room, uh, he again attacked him. He, he apparently had a few glass of port at the time, according to Tolkien. Uh, Lewis, this is and was somewhat vociferous again in his in-your-face attack on Campbell. Campbell took it very well. The two friends, uh, the, 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 the Lewis then subsequently invited Campbell to a meeting of the Inklings, and, and they became friends. So the enmity became friendship, as should be the case amongst Christians. But Tolkien, in one of his letters, which I won't read, um, talks about it's curious how... Uh, Lewis is up in arms if a, if a Protestant is uh, is martyred or persecuted, but seems to not care so much when Catholic priests and nuns are murdered. Because uh, there are a dozen or so bishops, hundreds, uh, I think actually thousands of priests were murdered during the Spanish Civil War. A dozen or so bishops and uh, I don't know the exact number, but certainly well over a hundred nuns were murdered and many of those raped beforehand. But yet Lewis was on the side of the people who were perpetrating that. Um, so this, this, this surprised Tolkien. But anyway, these, these people became friends afterwards. Lewis's space trilogy is, is marvellous. Again, I'm not going to have time to talk about his work so much here because we're running out of time already. Um, but we see in that hideous strength, particularly the third of those books, uh, a vision of of, of post World War society, um, where um, where 
secularism is 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 becoming overtly tyrannical uh, and murderous uh, and destructive and anti-Christian. Uh, so again, it, perhaps in the spirit, it's not surprising, written around the same time as was well, written, I think, in the same year as Animal Farm by George Orwell, three years before uh, 1984, in the spirit of Benson's Lord of the World, which we have discussed, and Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World. So after the war, Lewis became very concerned uh, about uh, developments in the Anglican Church, particularly at the, at the proposals for the ordination of women. He wrote a, a, um, uh, an essay about priestesses in the church, where he talked about the, 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 the priest being in persona Christi in the person of Christ, and therefore priests is, is, should, should be male. This shows him more and more loggerheads with the drift of the Anglican Church. He also went to regular auricular confession, which is very unusual for Anglicans. In his last book, Letters to Malcolm, he said that um, uh, after the blessed sacrament, your neighbor is the most important thing. And this shows implicitly his belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, again, it's unusual for Anglicans to call... Um, the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, but to say after the Blessed Sacrament, your neighbor is more important is actually equating the Blessed Sacrament with God himself because the two great commandments, of course, to love the Lord thy God and to love thy neighbor. Uh, he believed in purgatory. We've seen that, uh, obviously, that the, the great divorce seems to be set in purgatory, but he wrote to his uh, friend, Sister Penelope, an Anglican nun, that uh, if it were allowed, could she come and visit him in purgatory? So Tolkien, uh, so Lewis not only believed in purgatory, he seemed to believe he was going there. So why, you know, that the, the, the Lewis is a somewhat singular Protestant. He's not uh, fully a Catholic, and we certainly can't claim that he uh, was, uh, but he's also somewhat odd in terms of fitting neatly into the evangelical mode uh, or mold uh, or the or the anglican mold so when tolkien said jokingly that the reason that lewis never became a catholic was the ulsterior motive yes yeah, play on words a pun as in ulster northern ireland where he was born which is with, with the very calvinistic presbyterianism there very anti-catholic uh, the austrian motive that's an oversimplification as we've just seen that lewis made a uh, many many uh, much progress towards a catholic understanding and i can't we can't we can't reduce it to mere bigotry even though it's a funny quip so um you know who's heard of a of of, a, of an anti-catholic bigoted ulster protestant going to confession believing in the blessed sacrament the male priesthood uh, or purgatory but he, but he was never comfortable with the position of the Pope. He was never comfortable with the position of the Blessed Virgin. So what then was C.S. Lewis? Um, um, well, his mere Christianity is certainly a highest common factor which we can all feel very comfortable with. In his works, we see uh, an absolute orthodoxy. Um, uh, again, my, my book, Further Up and Further In, which I've written for Tan Books, Understanding Narnia. Uh, shows the, the the profound orthodoxy um, of uh, of Lewis's work um, in, in his fiction uh, and his non-fiction. So um, I would finish basically by 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 coming towards the end of Lewis's life here. Tolkien, being Tolkien, um, took his son to see C.S. Lewis in 1963 when Lewis was on his deathbed and uh, his son was a Jesuit priest, uh, his son John. And obviously Tolkien might have been hoping that C.S. Lewis would uh, have a deathbed conversion like Oscar Wilde and, and others, uh, but it was not to be. They discussed literature. Um, so Lewis dies uh, in November of 1963 on the same day and date as the the, um, the assassination of JFK, of, of President Kennedy, and also on the same day was the death of Aldous Huxley. And of course, uh, 
Lewis's death and Aldous Huxley's death was was lost under the news of of the president uh, president's assassination, JFK's death. Um, one thing it would say, however, is that Lewis was convinced that uh, his works would not be read following his death. That uh, you know, within ten years of his death, he would be forgotten. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's no uh, mistake and no exaggeration to talk these days of a C.S. Lewis industry. Lewis sells more books, uh, sold far more books posthumously following his death than he ever sold during his own lifetime. The Lion and Witch in the Wardrobe, along with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, are amongst the top 20 best-selling works of literature of all time. So C.S. Lewis uh, is a giant uh, in this uh, literary revival of which we speak, and we can be thankful for his friendship with Tolkien, but we can be thankful most of all for uh, the great gift of his mind and his work and his storytelling gifts. Thanks be to God for C.S. Lewis, and thank you for joining me in this episode of The Authority. Until next time, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.